Our next guest is Admiral James Winnefield. Admiral Winnefield serves as the ninth Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and is committed to defending the nation in all domains, including the cyber domain. With the Secretary of Defense recent unveiling of the cyber strategy, cyber has become a top level focus at the Department of Defense. The strategy calls for a renewed partnership between the Department of Defense and industry. The commitment is demonstrated by having Admiral, the Admiral here to address this prestigious audience. So at this point, sir, I... All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, how sweet it is to be up here and not in Washington. So it feels sort of like a refreshing work release program for me uh, from the Pentagon jail. Uh, I really want to support the, or salute the West Point Cyber Center for hosting uh, this inaugural Joint Cybersecurity uh, Summit. And Mark, thank you for your uh, sponsorship. Really enjoyed your remarks earlier today. I was ticking off the points in some parts of my speech while you were talking. So I think that's a good thing, although you know, we'll see what happens. By the way, none of you are allowed to fall asleep. I know it's, you know, it's after lunch, uh, and uh, so I'm going to try to get your peak of sugar high here before it fades away, and it'll fade during the question and answer session, I'm sure, so that's good. But if you fall asleep, remember what happened to the North Korean defense minister recently? <laughs> we have an anti-aircraft gun outside, uh, manned by stellar West Point cadets, the ready to go. So I'm watching. I'm watching. We have the enforcers here. It's wonderful to see General Pace. And Admiral's, is Alan, Admiral Allen here? Uh, I heard he was going to be here, maybe he didn't make it, but I do see my old mentor, Admiral Fallon, here. Uh, and it's really great to see you and more of our, our country's top tech CEOs uh, than I can possibly name. Uh, but among them, I'd like to single out Byron Colley. Are you here, Byron? Okay. He scared the bejesus out of Chairman Dempsey when he sat with Goldman Sachs' security team to learn about the breadth of cyber attacks the financial sector faces every day. He came back and scared the bejesus out of us, you know, after that. When he's scared, we're like really scared. <clears throat> um, I also want to call out the exceptional leadership of Major General John Davis, who's been a rock in OSD's cyber policy shop and a prime mover behind the tremendous progress that we've made under Eric uh, Rosenbach's leadership. So thank you guys. Also, uh, Major General Paul Nakasone, who held down the cyber portfolio and the joint staff early in my own tenure here as vice chairman. And then Greg Conti, uh, making a real contribution uh, to leading the uh, Army Cyber Institute. So, also uh, Mark McLaughlin for helping organize veterans in Silicon Valley, and for his service as a one-man bridge between industry, government, and the military. And of course, uh, he's here. Mike Rogers is here because he, I'm giving him a ride back to Washington, so he's, <laughs> he's stuck. Uh, but it was really great to hear him speak earlier today, and we really are lucky to have him at the helm of U.S. Cyber Command, uh, uh, and we're grateful for what he does every day. Now, since one of today's themes is jointness, uh, I'd like to point out something about our Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Marty Dempsey, and myself to show just how joint we are. Um, Marty has actually visited the Naval Academy's Cyber Center, uh, where I have never been. And today, I'm visiting the Army's Cyber Center, where he has never spoken. Uh, we just hope the Air Force Academy doesn't take too much uh, offense that neither of us has visited their cyber center. <laughs> it's probably a good thing because it's far too nice out there and you want to talk about a work release program. We might not come back to Washington if we went out there. By the way, and please don't throw your rolls at me when I say this, congratulations to the U.S. Naval Academy for winning the Inter-Service Academy Cyber Defense Exercise this year. Uh, <laughs> I'll say in talking to Mike that uh, it, was not, uh, it was not an easy competition, and it was very, very close until the very end. So that's very comforting to somebody like me to see that we've got cyber warriors coming up um, from the very lowest ranks of our officer corps who know the business. I can tell you that my son is a plebe at the Naval Academy, and he tells me that the hardest course that he took his first semester at the Naval Academy was the cyber course. Uh, so it wasn't just fluff. Uh, it was uh, a, a really meaningful course that was, that was tough for them. Um, I want to zoom out for a bit. I know that Admiral Rogers has already shared how we're building out our cyber forces, talked a little bit about our newly released cyber strategy uh, that Secretary Carter launched last month on his trip to Silicon Valley. 
Now, I'm going to zoom out a little bit and shine a light from a little different perspective on what I see happening in the department vis-a-vis -vis technology in general and cyber in particular, because trends that we're seeing today make your conversation and our conversation together even more important. Now, all of you here from industry uh, are part of a revolution in commercial technology that's changing our world and certainly changing my world. You're also part of a Cold War shift in innovation from an R&D economy that was driven primarily by federal investment to an innovation economy primarily driven by private investment. If you think about it, Google today has more than twice the market capitalization of General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and Raytheon combined. Apple has twice the market capitalization of Google. Tim Cook could pay cash for the entire defense industry. Cash. Just as the commercial economy and technology has taken off, the R&D portion of our pie has fallen at the same time, over 40% in some places within the Defense Department. And the defense industry itself has shed a lot of its own R&D capability, uh, although not all of it, I would also say. If you compare federal to non-federal R&D over the last 20 years, you can see, if you look at it on a graph, just how dramatically the locus of innovation has shifted towards the commercial sector in the post-Cold War era. While this macro shift in technology was underway, our potential adversaries have learned a lot from us, and rapidly. They've either watched what we've done, or they've read what we've done, or they've just gone about stealing what we've done from our own defense contractor and, in some cases, our own military networks. We are hemorrhaging information at a dizzying rate, evidenced by the uncanny similarity of some of our potential adversaries' new weapons to the ones that we've been developing ourselves. In your business, industrial espionage is illegal. In my business, it can be fatal. Our adversaries have also learned how to tap into the global technology market that you're driving forward, which has many wonderful benefits for mankind, especially our teenagers, who can now share their pictures quicker than they ever have before. But this global mic uh, market for micro macro and microelectronics is making it much easier for our adversaries to catch up. For instance, if you look at our electronic warfare systems today, 96% of our most advanced systems are assembled using commercially available components. We only add about 4% special sauce on top of those components. What this means is that our adversaries can quickly mimic, or in some cases even surpass, our state-of-the-art systems simply with globally sourced components. Now, we've long counted on capability and capacity overmatch to overcome the twin tyrannies of initiative and distance that our most capable potential adversaries have. In other words, if we're going to fight Russia or China, we got to go a long way to do it, and we're not the ones who are going to start it. But we have always counted on our impressive capability and our impressive capacity to overcome that. But those gaps are closing very rapidly. Our pacing uh, threats are now only a step or two away from actual technological parity with us. Our margins are thinner in many places than they've ever been, and we're asking ourselves how to dig ourselves out of this hole. We will do this by doing what we've always been good at as a nation, and that is innovation. A large part of that answer in innovation, as I pointed out earlier, where the R&D is shifting, is going to come from you. It's going to come from the commercial sector. We understand this. You stand at the intersection of two important communities, the U.S. military and the deep well of technological innovation that comes from the commercial sector. And those of you graduates from the military academies understand this better than anybody else in the technical industry. You're an important part of a Venn diagram that we think needs to grow, a robust and enduring partnership between the department and the arteries of innovation in the commercial technology economy is foundational now to our nation's warfighting prowess. By interacting more systematically with the technolo technology economy, the department can better harness the fruits of what's coming out of that technology economy. To catalyze this interaction, as Mike referred to earlier, Secretary Carter's pursuing two related initiatives, and I think this goes to a question that was answered earlier in your session. The first is called the Defense Innovation Initiative. Sounds pretty blasé, right? Oh, yeah, we've done this before. But this is a very serious effort that was started by Secretary Hagel, picked up and continued by Secretary Carter, and Deputy Secretary of Defense Work and I are at the forefront of it, along with a very important teammate, 
named Stephanie O'Sullivan, who is the Deputy Director of National Intelligence, because it's so fundamental to making sure that we can do what we need to do in this area. This effort is intended to reinvigorate our high-end warfighting capabilities in four essential ways. By concentrating on getting the most qualified possible people we can find into our business, millennials, who I'll talk about in a second, becoming much more efficient from a business perspective, and then two more, integrating new types of technology and operational concepts together. The two cannot exist in a vacuum. The concept developer has to be able to dream and say, gosh, if I could only do this, and have the technologists come up and say, well, I can do that for you. I just need to put some of these things together, these different disparate ideas, and I can make that happen. At the same time, if the technology developer is coming up with something really cool, it would be nice for the concept developer to understand that and say, gosh, I can weave that into what I'm trying to do in this new way of fighting wars. By doing all of this, we intend to regain our margin over our near-peer adversaries. And you may have heard of an initiative called the Advanced Capability and Deterrence Panel, and that's what this is all about, where we have had technolo major technological edges over adversaries in the past that have eroded, and then we've created a new technological advantage in the over that has again eroded and now we're on the same track to try to regain that edge. Cyber is going to be a very important part of this defense innovation initiative. Cyber is what I would call um, the land, the gray zone. Fading borders is really what I, I used to refer to it. The borders are fading between um, uh, state and individual. The borders are fading between war and peace. The, bo the borders are fading between espionage and war. The borders are fading between civil and military, uh, and private and public. Uh, it's a very, very important uh, piece that obviously is why we're all here today, and it's foundational to both our military's offensive and our defensive capabilities. So look at how good we have become in something called network warfare. There really are two principal things that we've learned in the last 15 years that have really advanced our military's state of the art of how we do business. One of those is intelligence operations integration, where believe it or not, our, our special operations forces actually taught us how to integrate intelligence and operations like we've never done it before. And the other thing is the way we do network warfare. We can fight faster than anybody on the planet right now, which is a huge advantage, but it's also a huge vulnerability. Now I'll get to a few imperatives in cyber in a few moments, but I first want to tell you that in order how to strengthen how we're inter interacting with industry in cyber and in other emerging technologies, we're taking a couple of important steps. And Mike alluded to these a little bit. One thing we're doing is creating a first of its kind unit in Silicon Valley called Defense Innovation Unit X. Sexy name, I know, I didn't make it up, but it's called Defense Innovation Unit X. It's gonna be staffed by some of our brightest active duty and civilian personnel and augmented by a new reserve unit, custom designed for those who work as technologists in their civilian life, and I know many of you are probably reservists. Their mission is to strengthen the connection between the Defense Department and the firms and startups in Silicon Valley and to help scour for new technologies without being obtrusive and you know, frightening in the process. Defense Innovation Unit X will also be one way we help bring new talent into the department. We're also starting a DOD branch of the U.S. Digital Service. Uh, I had never heard of this thing until about a month ago, but it was an elite group of programmers who were brought in by the White House to help fix healthcare.gov when it, it didn't roll out so well. Um, we are beginning also a partnership with InQtel, um, the CIA's venture capital arm you're well familiar with, and in reorienting the Secretary's Fellows Program, which allows some of our best uniformed personnel to gain experience in companies like Oracle, Cisco, FedEx, uh, 3M, and the like. These fellows will uh, essentially send, spend a year with one of those companies, which they already do, uh, and then they will be required to spend a year actually leveraging what they learned in industry uh, into something that will help us in DOD. They bring back two things with them. The most important thing to me that they bring back is they can capture how uh, commercial industries are actually doing innovation. And that, it doesn't matter in that, for that particular thing whether they go back into something that they were doing in industry or not, because that, they can help run a BCT, a brigade combat team, with that kind of an innovative spirit better than they could if they didn't have it. But if they can also put the icing on the cake by coming back into something that they were actually doing, it really works. And believe it or not, we don't do that very well. 
We have a, sort of the poster child on the joint staff right now where we have a Marine Lieutenant Colonel who went off and worked with Microsoft for a year and we actually, believe it or not, we actually brought him back onto the joint staff into the J6 and he works in our J6, which is our, obviously our, our uh, networking director. And he's doing great work coming back from there. I'm also, and this will make some of you old guys roll over in your, in your uh, sleep or on your, on your beds or whatever, uh, we're going to try to get them some joint duty credit for the time that they spend with industry because we think it's so important that we bring this commercial expertise back into the military. Um, but we'll make sure they get a little jointness buffing up while they do it. Anyway, we're going to do that. We're going to work very, very hard at getting this, this, that particular program rolling. Now, these innovations are part of Secretary Carr's Force of the Future initiative that some of you may have heard about in the media. He intends to chip away at the wall that has over time been erected between the military and industry, making it so hard for those who serve on one side to also take a tour on the other. What this means also is that those cadets coming up from the academy's cyber programs will have very different career paths than what you all might have experienced in your early years in the military. <clears throat> when many of you left active duty, you faced an all or nothing choice, stay or go, uh, when you reached the end of your commitment. In the past, the National Guard didn't have purpose-built units for civilians working in the cybersecurity world. There was no Defense Innovation <coughs> Unit X with its reserve unit for technologists. And the department wasn't putting its energies into recruiting top talent from industry to serve in exchange programs as the DOD Chief Information Operator, uh, op, um, Officer is actually doing today. So let's say you're one of the dynamo warriors out there at Mike's Cybercom, who after several years is itching to go found a startup or join a, a hot new company out in the Bay Area. By the time the Secretary's Future of the Force initiative is complete, that cyber dynamo may also have a chance to leave but join a reserve unit based right at Moffett Field in the heart of Silicon Valley or come back to the department for a year as a civilian IT expert. I can't tell you how many guys have come up to me and said, you know, it's getting a little old showing teenagers how to share their pictures with each other more efficiently. I want to do something for my country. Okay, so they're willing to do this kind of thing, to come back and work with us for a year. Many of them have made all the money they need to make anyway, and they just want to serve. Um, but we're very, very interested in uh, more permeability to that kind of um, participation. All of these changes are going to be especially attractive to what we call the millennials. <clears throat> We're in the middle of a generational turnover in our workforce just as you are in yours. As you know from your own companies, the crowd coming in has different preferences and different habits from what we old fogies have who lead them. They like challenge. They like change. They want to do something positive in the world and they want to do it quickly. They're very impatient. They prefer very small teams rather than large organizations. They're very mobile, and they're very unlikely to stay at the same company for 20 years. And they're not as willing as we were to automatically grant credibility to others on the basis of age or experience. Millennials have grown up in a world of ubiquitous burst communications, cell phones, the Twitterverse, Facebook, Instagrams, and you, Snapchat, things I've never even heard of. But they have, by the very nature of the world around them, also been educated differently. On balance, they're a remarkable group who populate the best military I've seen in my 37 years of service. And I'm often asked, isn't it hard to lead those millennials? I say, no, they're perfect for us. We love them, especially because they're the Xbox generation and they make hellacious fighter pilots. <laughs> Better than I ever was. Um, and what I really love about them is that they hate bureaucracy, which puts pressure on us. And so it's a great thing. And we're going to need their talent, especially in the cyber world, because we face tough challenges in that domain that all of you very well appreciate. I want to talk a little bit about how we handle those challenges by talking about two of our paradigms of cyber defense and how we effectively deter cyber attacks. Three things. For a long while now, signature-based defenses have anchored our approach to thwarting malicious attacks. That's the first paradigm. Mark alluded to that a little bit earlier when, in saying that we want to make sure that only the first attack gets through, right? the first vector. We are dependent to a large degree on dissecting a previous attack that we've experienced, developing a counter to that type of attack, and then equipping our global sensor network and individual networks and individual boxes, in some cases, to detect and counter that type of attack. In short, we're only able to recognize and defend against punches that have been thrown at us before. 
when a new type of punch comes at us, we have to take the blow, then take time to figure out what happened, then equip our brains to recognize and defend against it. And while all that's happening, we are essentially defenseless unless we simply shut down our networks, which Mike very eloquently <coughs> earlier said is not really an option for us if we're going to keep being the best military in the world uh, at using network warfare. So we're entering an area where that's no longer going to work. We can no longer afford to base our defenses on only stopping malicious code that we've seen before. A single attack can be so destructive that we can't even allow one to slip past the moat. For that reason, I think we need to build a new paradigm of cyber defense, one that's extremely challenging, one that's built on new technological architectures. We have to be able to detect a new type of attack as it's occurring and stop it in its tracks. And you know, you technologists know how very hard that's going to be. Or we have to render the term attack irrelevant by configuring our networks and the software running on them in ways that just make it impossible for an ad adversary to attack them in the first place. A handful of you are helping pioneer whole new ways of doing this, but as I said, it's not an easy problem. <clears throat> the business and startups you run are inventing new ways to wrap firmware and OS code in layers of encryption, new ways to embed secure enclaves onto chips themselves so that hardware and software work in tandem to detect deviations, and new ways to use data analytics to detect penetrations. You're also using what I would call crazy math and crazy programming to randomize, fragment, reconfigure, and make continually unique ways of running software and systems so that an adversary who finds a way to break in once will not succeed the next time. But it's one thing to navigate your way into a single operating system. It's another thing to figure out your way into its 64 million permutations. What I'm saying is that we desperately need the help of industry to speed our passage into a new paradigm of cybersecurity dominated by technologies other than signature-based detection. This is a big data problem that connects data, analytics, placement, and visualization within a complex ecosystem of ISPs, cybersecurity form, firms, software providers, hardware manufacturers, and data storage companies. To me, this kind of big data is a big deal. To me, it's the Manhattan Project of cyber defense. So while signatures are going to continue to be a large part of cybersecurity for years to come, and we know that, my hope is that one of you in the audience is already well on your way to ensuring that they're not the only layer of defense, that there's a better layer. Another paradigm I'm particularly passionate about is that cybersecurity is not all about technology. It most decidedly is not all about technology. And Mark alluded to this earlier as well. While the technology of cybersecurity is important, we should not overlook the element of human performance that is a significant part of network operations. Secretary Carter disclosed last month that Russian hackers accessed one of our dot mil networks. I think Mike talked about it earlier. They got in by attacking an old vulnerability that had simply not been patched in a legacy platform. And there are countless examples like that in the military and in industry where something like this has happened. Click on a spear phishing email. Insert a corrupted thumb drive into your computer. You name it. Hackers affiliated with ISIL, as you know, briefly took control of Central Command's Twitter account because we were using single-factor authentication. More consequentially, as Mike alluded to, a foreign nation broke into the Navy's unclassified network by exploiting a known security flaw unknowingly left in a public-facing website. The most serious breach of a U.S. classified network occurred several years ago when a thumb drive loaded with malware was inserted against protocol directly into a secure desktop machine because somebody was in a hurry. The fact is that mistakes made by network administrators and users are frequently, most often I would say, the genesis of a successful attack. Human error is the biggest factor I know of in cybersecurity. It's a bigger factor than I think most of us realize. One of the most important lessons emerging from our experience is that while upgrades to system administration and layers of technical defenses have played a crucial role, minimizing human error in network operations has been arguably the most important factor behind security gains we have achieved. And we have much more that we can and should do in this area. And what it means is that when we, it comes to cyber defense, people matter as much or more than technology. Inculcating network operators and users with the tenets 
required to perform with the highest degree of precision and reliability is to me one of the new frontiers of cybersecurity. It's not enough to build flawlessly configured technical systems. It's also critically important to build a culture of performance among those who manage and actually use IT. Many of you who came up through the military have been part of a culture of high performance somewhere else, whether it's the nuclear program, as Mike mentioned, or special operations forces, or um, advanced uh, aircraft technologies, or the space program, you name it. Whether you were part of a unit or a crew of an airplane, it doesn't matter. Each of, those, each of you have an experience that gives you special insight into how leaders organize teams of people to perform and minimize critical mistakes. What you want to avoid is the little mistake that can cascade into a big one. So as you approach your own secures or careers as cybersecurity experts, I would urge you to not lose sight of the human dimension. I actually view this as a national security imperative. One of our challenges going forward now is how to build a stronger culture of human performance around network operations, and we're trying very hard to do that in the military. I'd like to close by talking a little bit about cyber deterrence. It's crucial for us to all not overlook how potentially destabilizing cyber can be. If you're familiar with the, the terminology used in nuclear deterrence, it's eerily familiar to the, the, what we should be talking in terms of cyber deterrence. Because we're talking about weapons of war that on the click of a mouse can change the physical reality of faraway places in a dramatic way, even entire nations. Cyber, cyber weapons are powerful, they're secret, and they carry their own mystique. For that reason, they're potentially destabilizing strategically. With dozens of militaries moving forward with offensive cyber programs, having clarity of deterrence in the cyber domain is even more important. This is not the first time states have been faced with technologies that complicate the calculus of how to interact with one another. I just talked about the nuclear age. For that reason, it's important to think about a new in new ways about deterrence in the cyber regime. It'll be vital to ensuring the potential volatility of the cyber uh, domain does not manifest it in, in a sudden and unexpected escalatory exchange between us and a large nation or even a moderate-sized nation. It's especially important when we have more to lose from such an attack than our potential adversary does. Now, the President made our position very clear in his 2011 International Cyberspace Strategy. He said, when warranted, the United States will respond to hostile acts in cyberspace as we would any other threat to our country. And we recognize that certain hostile acts conducted through cyberspace could compel actions under the commitments we have with our military treaty partners. Now, we deter in several different ways. I would list three. First, we deter by denying the adversary any benefit from an attack. Second, we deter by making our system so resilient that a successful attack is actually repaired quickly. We call that resilience. But we also can deter by threatening to impose costs on an adversary by holding at risk the assets that that adversary values the most. This is reiterated in our new cyber strategy, which specifically refers to convincing a potential adversary that it will suffer unacceptable costs if it conducts an attack on the United States. To be sure, those costs that we might impose on that adversary could involve non-cyber response to a cyber act. It's important to make clear in the mind of an adversary that an action was actually a reaction, which is not always easy for us to do in cyberspace. And we also want to respond in ways that exploit a perpetrator's true vulnerabilities. And not surprisingly, not all the countries that threaten us are as vulnerable in cyberspace as we would like them to be, certainly not to the extent we are. So options such as the cyber executive order, the administration produced in the wake of the Korean attack on Sony, are definitely part of our set of cyber response options. But in my personal view, and depending on the situation, part of cyber deterrence has to be cyber offense. But it's a complex tool that we certainly cannot take lightly. To borrow lingo again from the world of nuclear deterrence, response options for both counter force namely targeting an adversary's military forces, and counter value, namely targeting the other things that he holds dear, are an essential part of cyber deterrence. It's especially true if a potential adversary has already himself pursued those pathways. In the counter force world, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, Mark Welsh, 
recently discussed with remarkable candor what some of those options are in the air domain. Which of our counterforce or countervalue cyber capabilities we disclose, and when we do so, can be a, a decision for policymakers. But our adversaries need to have a sense for just how vulnerable they are in the cyber domain if they should choose to attack us. In this spirit, Secretary Carter said last month that one of the three missions of the military and cyber is to provide cyber offensive options that, if directed by the President, can augment our other military systems. Making this clear is important because of how it affects an adversary's calculus and thus the overall stability or instability of the cyber domain. And the place I don't want to be is where an adversary assumes that we have a cyber retaliation cap capability if we really don't. So we need to make sure that we have that, that it, and that it's robust. So in closing, before I respond to questions, if your blood sugar is going back down, I'd like to thank each one of you for being here today. I know it's a big sacrifice for you to leave your very productive businesses and careers to come all the way to West Point and sit down together and, and put your heads together on where we're going in this very, very important discipline. So thank you for being here. You are what we Navy people call plank owners of a Venn diagram that's very, very vitally important to our nation and to our nation's security. And you understand that better than anybody else in the business. The challenges that I talked about are going to be with us for some time to come. It's another long war. We need to move with a sense of urgency and purpose in the areas that I've talked about and that Mike talked about. Emerging technology will be a crucial ingredient in doing so, especially in cyber, but also in other technical areas that overlap what you do every day. We'll do this in the cyber arena by making the wall between the Department of Defense and industry much more permeable so our nation's brightest minds can bring more leverage to helping us keep our nation safe. And I would urge each of you, and I think you are because you're here, to be part of the solution. Harness the very best of what America is doing today in this domain. Work well for your customers. Anytime you make progress in securing their networks, you make our nation safer. Let's also work well together. Let's join forces to ensure we can maintain an edge over our potential adversaries in this complicated, very fruitful, but inherently dangerous domain. And in so doing, I think we'll all together provide a very important service to our nation. And with that, I thank you very much for inviting me up here today. I've enjoyed the earlier session that I uh, was fortunate enough to attend, and I hope you keep that momentum going and get a lot out of the rest of today and tomorrow. Thank you very much, and I would be happy to take a couple questions. Sir. more robust cyber defense and ask the industry to provide these technologies to make our infrastructure more secure. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is that, that only the definition of us that makes sense is the world, is everybody. Any technologies that are developed and built will be used by every one nation state and mm -hmm. non-nation state. So anything we do to increase our resilience, mm -hmm. infrastructure security will naturally mm -hmm. make Admiral Rogers both intelligence and attack jobs much harder. Yep. And are you okay with that? Yes. I think Mike's okay with that also. He has, uh, it's a really, really good question. We call it IGO. Everybody know what IGO stands for? Intel gain loss. And there's this constant tension between the operational com community and the um, intelligence community when uh, a, a military action could cause um, the loss of a critical intelligence node. And we live this every day. Uh, in, in fact, in ancient times, when we were collecting actual signals in the air, uh, we, we would be on the operational side, I want to take down that emitter so it'll make it safer for my airplanes to penetrate the airspace. And they're saying, no, you've got to keep that emitter up because I'm getting all kinds of intelligence from it. So this is a familiar problem. But I think we all win if our networks are more secure. Um, and uh, I, I think I would rather live on the side of secure networks and a harder problem for Mike on the intelligence side than very vulnerable networks and an easy problem for Mike. And part of that, it's not only the right thing to do, but part of that goes to the fact that we are more vulnerable than any other country in the world uh, on, on our dependence on cyber. I'm also very confident that Mike has some very clever people working for him <laughs> that, <laughs> that might actually still be able to get some good work done. Uh, but it's an excellent question. It really is. Sir. I've been waiting for time. Would you like to add some more information on how best to create the culture of, I think you said it was human performance? 
Yeah, um, I think that, uh, and I want to be careful because I'm actually writing an article for a magazine on this, so you know I, I, I could get in trouble with the editors, right? But uh, if you take a look at the organizations that are out there, okay, and you can find them and pick them, who uh, find themselves uh, at greatest risk for human error, where, where a catastrophe can occur when a, a single human makes an error, however small. And what those, co those companies or government organizations or what have you have done to uh, eliminate that human performance risk without being crazy about it. What techniques have they used? What principles do they espouse? Uh, I think you'll find a mother load of, of uh, again, exp operational experience, operational excellence that you can tap into that is directly applicable to the cyber world. Uh, and uh, so run off and find those guys, whether it's NASA, uh, which has been through some trouble, right? I mean, they, they've had very tough problems, but, but they attacked them with gusto uh, and have turned themselves into a, a very reliable organization. You can look at uh, the Navy Nuclear Propulsion Program. You can look at the Air Force Nuclear Weapons Program. They've gone through a very difficult time and have really come out of that very well. Um, where are, and where are the companies that are particularly vulnerable to that sort of behavior? What has the New York Stock Exchange done? I don't know if they have that, that sort of an ethic. But find what they've done, what principles they espouse, and I think you'll tap into uh, some pretty good, good uh, uh, ability there to eliminate human error. What have other people done in other domains? One more question? Unless there are no questions. Blood sugar? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. All right, well, thank you very much for inviting both Mike and I up here. And uh, God bless you for what you do. And thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your cooperation. And we're going to adjourn here for a few minutes. In about 10 minutes, we'll meet back in the main uh, conference room.